periclutus anfugues, tonicelon hoion potheniclon so eureie, taidalos escese, caliprocamon ariadne, ensamen ei teioi, cae parce noi alfesi boia, orche un salle non epicarpo cheira secontes, Tonda i men lettas, otonas e con oi de chitona. Eia te umnitus e castin bonta zelaio. Caida i men calas, te fanas e con oi de macaidas. Ei con cruzo i jas e tsai tu reon te la mono. So hello and welcome to the virtual platform of Looms in Motion, put together by the research team of the Penelope Project, housed at the Deutsches Museum in Munich. I'm Julin Lee, the current research assistant of the group, and with me is Alex McLean, who is postdoctoral researcher in the team. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, nice to see you. I'm sorry I can't be with you in Munich. I'm here in Sheffield in the UK. Right. Um, and a different situation where all that we'd have been together, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, it is such a pity because this is like our end of project exhibition slash celebration. But um, but all the same, I'm looking forward to chatting yeah. with you today about the exciting work you have been doing over the past four years as part of the um, Penelope project and beyond. Um, so to start us off, Alex, like um, how would you describe the Penelope project and how you are involved? Right. So, yeah, Penelope is about um, sort of uh, looking at weaving as a technology, um, ancient weaving and um, in, in the history of technology, um, science and technology, seeing um, weaving for what it is, which is a sort of mathematical craft. Um, and uh, one that sort of lies at the foundation of computation um, and computing, uh, not in terms of something like the jacquard, um, although that has a, a important uh, part in history, the automation of the uh, loom with uh, jacquard's work, um, but earlier than that, really, we're looking at uh, ancient weaving, particularly in ancient Greece, um, and uh, investigating weaving as a technology and how it influences are thinking about mathematics and so on. Um, but I'm not really a weaver. I'm more of a computer programmer and a creative uh, technologist. Um, so my role is really looking at weaving as a source of inspiration, um, understanding it from um, my viewpoint as a computer programmer, but not in terms of seeing how weaving can be improved, but really the other way around, how um, computer programming languages can be improved uh, because weaving's been with us for thousands of years. Uh, computer programming's only been here for about 50 or so. Um, so it's really undeveloped in terms of its place in uh, culture compared to a technology like weaving. So um, looking uh, at weaving uh, in order to see how um, the experience of computer programming and the interface for computer programming can be improved and made more creative. Brilliant. Like, I, I just want to quickly say that Alex has shared various aspects of his work on the Penelope blog in a very accessible manner, so be sure to check that out. And um, most of his publications are open access and can be found on either his personal blog or on the group's Zenodo page if you're keen on going into further detail. And um, all the links will be found can be found in the description box below, so um, do check those out as well. Yeah, and um, what we heard at the beginning, uh, before we began this conversation was um, a part of what is called the Penelopean performance. Uh, maybe, Alex, would you like to tell us a bit about what that was about? Yeah, so this is a collaboration between myself, Giovanni, who is a philologist. He looks at ancient texts, um, rereading them in ancient Greek and uh, looking for connections between um, early thought in mathematics and weaving and so on. Um, so it, he was reciting uh, some ancient Greek lyric um, and I was doing some live coding to 
um, explore similar patterns. Um, so in this, um, in these uh, uh, poems, um, the meter, the sort of underlying pulse, um, which tends to have a sort of long, short, short, long, short, short structure, um, uh, sort of trying to replicate that and work with that, transform it in different ways, um, and also work um, in inspired by something which Giovanni uh, told me about called epiploky, which is a particular transformation which treats a rhythm as a cyclic repetition and sort of brings it, rotates it forwards and backwards in time. Um, so this is the kind of uh, pattern that I find really fascinating, how you can take something um, like rotational symmetry, apply it to something like music or weaving, um, and really trans take uh, a simple rhythm and just do these simple trans transformations uh, and, and find all kinds of um, uh, effects on your perception that are really quite unexpected. Just by adjusting uh, a rhythm, moving it backwards and forwards, um, you find uh, all kinds of strange interplays happen um, in syncopation uh, and stress patterns and things. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and um, maybe you could tell us about also the little robots that were doing uh, the maple dance. Yeah, it's such a funny little <laughs> performance, this, uh, <laughs> as well as Giovanni and me um, doing that. Uh, Dave Griffiths, who is also part of the project, um, uh, as part of a um, non-profit research organization called Then Try This. Um, but he, he was uh, made these robots that would do maypole dancing. So uh, again, controlling them with these patterns, which are inspired by weaving as well. Um, uh, moving them around a pole in opposite directions, getting them to move around each other so that they create a braid on the pole, um, like maypole dancing and also uh, penal kolatam in um, in uh, in India, in, uh, the Tamil, Tamil Nadu have this uh, dance, and yeah, all, all these traditional dances that involve uh, dancing and braiding around uh, a maypole, um, and it's just such a, a nice thing to think about uh, the connection between human movement, um, following a pattern, moving in and out of each other, um, creating a pattern on the pole. It's another sort of connection between uh, textile and movement and uh, rhythm and, mu and music, and so. I suppose this uh, Penelope and performance is all about um, investigating how these patterns sort of uh, move between these uh, very different forms and come together, as they used to do in ancient Greece, where dance and uh, music and uh, poetry would just be part of one um, celebration. What the team has been doing is develop digital tools that help um, help us understand what's going on at the loom when a weaver weaves and also to represent that knowledge for people who, who don't know how to weave hands-on. And so one of these tools, of course, is um, the live loom that you've developed and uh, what's right next to you today, which is great. <laughs> Maybe you could tell yes, us a is. bit about <laughs> how it works and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can try. So um, yeah, that's absolutely. It's for me, that's sort of the two main aspects of my involvement. One is sort of looking for ways in which weaving can inform um, my practice as a creative technologist, and the other is sort of trying to share the um, the thought processes of weaving, which is very difficult because um, it's something where which you really have to do to really um, understand how these threads interact. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is do more workshops with this live loom, um, but that's quite difficult under current uh, travel restrictions. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I can um, show this uh, strange system that I've made. So um, up here, uh, here yeah. <laughs> you can see uh, this um, screen. Uh, the um, There's a bit of code here, which I can adjust. Um, uh, so this is, um, I haven't quite got time to explain everything that's going on, uh, but you can see that there's um, something that looks like computer code. Uh, so here there's a list of um, ups and downs. Um, this is what weaving is about really, ups and downs, or um, in uh, computers you, we tend to think about them being ones and zeros. Um, it's the same thing, it's, it's a binary um, representation where something's either on or off or up and down or uh, high or low. Um, 
Uh, so in, in that sense, all weaving is a uh, binary art form, or um, more generally a digital art form, even when um, you're just doing it um, without any electricity or computers involved, you're just working with a frame. It's a binary and digital art form. Right, and people all tend to mistake digital meaning contemporary technology, right? And when yes. digital art form can be something that's in analog form and going way back to like ancient times. So, yeah. Yes, yes. We've always uh, worked with ups and downs um, in textiles. Um, and that's all that uh, digi uh, binary means is uh, um, these sort of two states that you work together into a sequence um, so this, I mean, this this is something which I've made, um, and it doesn't really represent thought processes of weavers in general, uh, but it's what I've been using to make weaving patterns and experiment with them. Um, and uh, so here I've got the ups and downs, and I've added an extra bit of code every third row. That means um, double, which means that every third row it just repeats each up or down, um, so that it's repeated twice. And that's one third row, and you can see that there's two ups, two downs, another two downs, two ups, and so on. Um, and that's happened every third row. And here, every second row inverts, so that uh, that means every other row, um, an up becomes a down, and a down becomes an up. Um, so there's two transformations going on, and they interfere with each other because these numbers are different. Um, and I can move these numbers around and get different patterns. Um, so it's it's kind of an experimental thing. So you can see this pattern is changing. This is what actually gets sent to the loom, this live loom. Um, there's you should be able to see like two blue squares. That's sort of just showing the current row. Um, and um, if I just switch on a additional uh, camera. Um, you can see what I've been weaving with that code. Um, so here, um, uh, I've, I've done uh, probably about 16 rows of this pattern. Um, it might be a little bit hard to see. I'll show a photograph on the video. Um, but there's like a diagonal structure emerging, and then it sort of dissipates and becomes um, a different kind of structure. Um, and it actually doesn't look at all like um, the structure that I'm sending to it. Um, but the structure is there. So the ups and downs are there. You just can't see them because um, I'm also changing the color of the threads. Um, so I've got white and orange um, both on the ups and downs and the lefts to rights. So the ups and downs are called warps. The left to rights are called wefts. Um, and because they're alternating color actually, uh, you get this interference pattern where the um, sort of colors of the threads are interfering with the structure of the weave and you end up this um, uh, surprising result. Uh, it's called a color and weave effect um, that happens. Um, and this is mathematical or computational um, and surprising. And, and this is sort of what I really like about technology, whether it's ancient or um, contemporary, is when you set up these rules, you play with these words uh, for describing a pattern. Um, and you can kind of see how it's going to work, but you don't actually know what the end result is going to look like. I think that's um, what weaving really how weaving really excites me is when you come up with this pattern, you know it's going to do something interesting, but you don't know what it is. Um, and uh, you just have to weave it. And you have to weave quite a lot, like it took me um, a while before I could really see the pattern for what it was. So it's sort of a delayed gratification. <laughs> that is a good point. So like um, even <laughs> with um, contemporary technology, that's no shortcut to, to weaving anything. That's I think a, an important point to make. And I think, well, you, you, you sort of describe like how your from your code to that little draft that you see that pattern mm. on the screen doesn't tell you immediately what your final product is going to look like, right? So I was yep. kind of wondering like, you know, um, I think it would be utopic to think that every draft that you make will translate to some kind of functional um, structure that holds on when it's actually woven. So like, have you encountered, you know, um, limitations in that sense where like, you know, in theory it works, like 
there is that kind of pattern that's displayed on your screen, but like, um, but then maybe in practice it just fails or it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so so this loom is really not a practical loom at all. It's really just for exploring patterns. Um, like uh, it can only make these very thin um, weaves. Um, and, it, and it's totally true. Um, when I'm weaving these things, often it just doesn't hold together or the threads go in front of or behind each other or um, unweave each other unexpectedly. Um, and when this happens, uh, this is when I start learning about weaving. Um, I sort of learn about how weaving works um, by when it doesn't work, if that makes sense. So when <laughs> it falls apart, I can go back to the original pattern and try and see why that would be. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I should just actually show you uh, how the live loom works. I haven't yeah, brilliant. Done yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, so I've shown you this bit of code. I've shown you this structure, um, but I'll just um, send a row to the um, to the loom so you can see it work. Um, so it has selected the um, threads from this row. Um, and now I'm, I've grabbed hold of them and I'm pulling them. Um, and it's pulling forward um, a, a group of the uh, warps um, and it's making a gap between them. And that's where I pass the weft. Um, so I'm choosing the orange one this time because I chose the white one last time. Passing that through like this by hand. Um, and then I can go on to the next row. So now it's made another um, uh, set of warps to pull. And I do that and create that gap. This gap is called the shed. Um, a bit of uh, weaving um, jargon for you. Um, and then I pass that one um, and keep going. And you can hear um, actually a sort of rhythm being tapped out as it selects the thread, which is quite nice. Um, so there's a, it, it, it sort of pulls the threads one by one um, and that creates that rhythm and that's quite nice for sort of hearing the pattern as well as feeling it and uh, seeing it. Um, it sort of adds that extra um, dimension of perception I suppose and it, it kind of helps you get into the rhythm of the weave, being able to hear it. Um, I've actually recently done a nice collaboration with my friend Rosa Cisneros, who's a flamenco dancer, where we did a workshop where she, in one side of the room, she was um, uh, teaching flamenco dancing, and in the other side, I was uh, doing weaving with this, and it was nice thinking about uh, working with these young kids and um, seeing how they think about these different kinds of patterns um, in an embodied way. Mm. Um, well, this one is more of like, well, the, the rhythmical pattern, at least one that I heard was, it was like short, long, short, long. Well, long is probably because there is a rest because that, that particular um, yeah. solenoid wasn't being selected. So there's a very rhythmical element to this, which some people would consider musical in that sense. Like, have you, yeah, <laughs> yeah have, you, have you ever tried like um, to weave a musical rhythm that you've thought of, like working the other way around, not necessarily producing a rhythm from um, from the weave, but trying to put the rhythm and see what kind of fabric you get. Um, I haven't. I th it's something that um, I'd like to try. Um, it'd be nice to try this with uh, Rosa and see how it translates. But I think um, I think music and weaving. You, you do kind of see these correspondences between the patterns, but at the same time, the patterns are completely different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm sure uh, you as a musicologist know what I'm talking about when uh, um, I say that music is multidimensional. There's so many different ways in which the, s the sounds can change over time. Whereas in Weave, it's really, it's, it's constrained in a very particular way. So, um, 
the um you can't have like uh you can't have a, a thread that splits into two well actually you can in some kinds of textiles as well. <laughs> but um it, it would be very common to take uh two um notes and split them into uh into parts into three for example to create a triplet um and uh of course you have drones and and sounds which change over time in music and all kinds of things going on so although there are these correspondences particularly with this uh, very uh simple rhythms um there's also lots of differences so i think trying to make a piece of music translate into uh, a cloth um it's it's a very nice idea but in practice um it's impossible because the way that we perceive sound over time how things change is very different to how we look at a two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional weave, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, in a fabric, well, the fabric has to actually hold. And in yes. music, it's like, um, it's up to us what we want to really define as music or organized sound or really noise. <laughs> um, yeah. So in that sense, the music would work, but probably the fabric won't. But um, Coming back mm. to that rhythm, it's um it's not only a form of sonic accompaniment. It also sounds like if there is a mistake in that pattern for any reason, if there was um a mechanical failure at some point, in theory you would also be able to tell from the rhythm that something isn't that something has gone wrong. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think yeah, our our perception of sound is so well tuned to to hearing things which don't fit a pattern so yeah i, th I think making um and, and uh, i think even using a, a non-augmented loom you'd 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 hear the same kind of things maybe you know, there's something about how the shuttle moves you'd be able to hear if it uh, something had caught or something um yeah. oh wow okay i never thought about it that way because yeah it's really um it's really quite obvious it goes like right yeah. when the <laughs> when the sonar is picked and i thought like wow so like this machine is giving you all all kinds of feedback it's visual it's haptic and there's mm. also this auditory component together which really embodies like the interdisciplinary nature of the whole um penalty project so i thought that was wow yeah <laughs> yeah okay um but maybe we could go back to to that idea of like what you see on code is not what you not necessarily what translates into the weave. So there, there is this um, perceptual gap between code, draft, and the weave. And so like, I can see that, you know, it's amazing. You have a code and through the code, you can theoretically explore like limitless variations to a pattern and everything. But at the same time, the disadvantage is, of course, it takes you one step away from doing the actual weaving itself. Yeah, I think um yeah, that's a really important point I think you're making there. I think the as, as a creative technologist, um you're always dealing with this trade-off. Um on one hand, um you're more distant from the work because you're putting a computer between yourself and the and the work whether it's weaving or music or whatever. Um but you're kind of on this higher level, this kind of comp compositional level where you're able to um, work with sound um, as a high level pattern. Um, I, I suppose I often think about this in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of a laptop versus a drum. If you're playing a set of drums, then it's very direct. If you want to change something, you just change it immediately and you're really feeling the sound, you're feeling the vibration of the, of the um, drum skin um, and, and, and resonating with it, uh, literally. Um, whereas um, with computing, you're more distant. With computer music, you're more distant. Um, but you have this kind of um, very precise control and you also have um, high level control where you can change one thing and it'll change lots of sounds rather than just changing one sound um, and I think it's the same with the loom you saw that I moved a number and then the pattern changed completely all, all the ups and downs shifted around um, whereas if I was um, working directly just with it this is a hand loom without the computer control then I'd have very I'd, I'd be much closer to each movement I suppose uh, 
but then I wouldn't have that sort of high level um, high level control. Maybe it'd be useful to um, look at a musical example now to try and uh, uh, ground this uh, point a bit more. What do you think? Mm -hmm, um, definitely. So, um, because my background really is in music, not in weaving. I don't really consider myself a weaver, even though I've really enjoyed weaving on this project. Um, and uh, so I, I came to this project as a live coder. Um, so live coding is where you write code to make music um, while the music's playing. Um, so you change the code to change the music. Uh, and, and that means that, uh, again, I'm further away from individual sounds, but I have this sort of high level control over um, the uh, structure of the music that's playing. Um, so this is um, a environment I made called Tidal Cycles. Um, and it is really about pattern in the similar way to um, the patterns I was playing with just then on the live loop. Um, so uh, I can uh, make a kind of simple uh, rhythm. So let's take uh, a drum kit called Gretsch and um, choose some drum sounds from that. Uh, let's see if I can get this working. There we go. So maybe, yeah, that's loud enough, isn't it? Uh, so I can sort of adjust this a bit, maybe uh, break down this step and put a couple more sounds in there. So I'm just referring to different sounds by number here. I'll just uh, silence that for a second. Um, so this is similar to what I was doing with the loom with the ups and downs, just like making a list of sounds. But I have a bit more control over the rhythm. Um, but then similarly, I can um, pattern that by transforming it in different ways. For example, I could simply uh, reverse it like this. And I could maybe say every third repetition, reverse it. <laughs> or I could say every um, fourth repetition, make it twice as fast. Um, yeah, there it goes. <laughs> Or I could say hurry instead, which is similar, but it um, plays at high pitch as well. Um, and then I could do something like um, reverse it, but just in one speaker or one headphone, depending on how you're listening to this. Um, and then I can keep adding these transformations. this is now breaking down that rhythm into four parts um, and then successively hurrying up a different chunk of that uh, uh, cycle every uh, repetition. Um, I might change this a bit now. Um, oh, interesting. <laughs> going on it's um it's uh, taking a simple rhythm and transforming it but then transforming the result of that and transforming the result of that and each little transformation is quite simple um, but when you have more than one of these happening and, and working on the same um, pattern then it quickly becomes complex to the point where um, I'm not sure what's going to happen when I add something else um, I understand each thing individually, but I don't know how all these different transformations are interfering with each other. Um, and this is what fascinates me with weaving and what fascinates me with music. Um, and it's really nice sort of developing this common approach to both, even though, as we say, weaving 
and music have very different constraints. They fall apart in different ways. Um, uh, this idea of um, approaching it as something which is uh, kind of computational, um, uh, a pattern, I think, is really just a, another word for computation in that sense. Um, and it, it becomes something very con sort of creative and improvisational where you're just um, writing code, but um, you're not focusing so much on the code you're writing, but on the on the music or the weave that's coming out. Um, so coding then becomes much more about perceiving than, than, than writing code, or, or at least both together um, in as part of the same experience and the same um, action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought together like the you highlighted the parallels between weaving and and um, and live coding music in this sense. But I kind of wondered whether like you know when we talk about interference, especially when we talked about in our previous example, it was really the interference between two very clear structures. Like one is um, the ups and downs, and another one is the color. So I wonder whether here, you know, could you. Um, you know, is it possible to write two different patterns and then sort of weave them together in that sense? It, can we understand um, title in this way, or is it really just um, this gradual build up and successive transformation of one pattern, which you call interference? Yeah, th th there's quite a lot of different ways of um, exploring pattern. Um, and there is actually a function in Tide, or if I switch that one off, called Weave, which does work in that kind of way. Um, let's see if I can remember how to use it. Uh, <laughs> so if I had uh, quite a simple um, rhythm again, um, I tend to start with really simple sequences. Um, so maybe just like, um, so this is uh, uh, some musical notes on something called a pentatonic scale. So um, quite a nice simple scale to work with the musical scale. Um, so what does that sound like? So that just goes up. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see if I can weave that, if I can remember how. So there's this function weave, um, and so I just... So with weaving, you have like two directions, one which is the warp going down and then the weft which you introduce um, through the ups and downs. So we'll treat that as the kind of warp, I suppose. And now let's add uh, a, um, yeah, let's add a vowel effect. So you can kind ah. of see, see what that sounds like. Um, let's try that. So now it's um, stepping up the this slower, um, going through this uh, twice for each one, um, because I've said 16 here, and there's eight of them, so it's going through each of these twice. But, uh, Maybe you can hear what's going on and see what's going on and I don't have to explain too much. <laughs> um, and now I'll add a different uh, pattern on top. I think you can probably hear what the vowel filter is doing. It's just making the sound, filtering it a bit so it sounds a bit like the vowel which I'm typing. Mm -hmm. So let's try. can hear that now there's two layers, one which is this. Um, at the moment this layer is here, gradually going up, and this is halfway behind it here. Um, so what else can I do? I could try um, adding a couple more layers. This time I'll change the speed of the sound, which would affect its pitch again. Um, not sure exactly what's going to happen with this. Um, okay, yeah, that's a bit like weaving. Um, and then I can 
start transforming the whole thing as well, maybe doing this. Or maybe I can change this number, see what that sounds like. This, so it starts going down instead. <laughs> it sounds like way more than two voices right now. It's like yeah. <laughs> interesting how just by adding a bit of reverb that really changes the feel of everything um, and that's what I find ma magical about music really one changing one small thing can just change the whole emotion and the whole feel of uh, of everything you're doing and everything in interacts with each other in a different way um, maybe to um, to wrap up this music session on, on live coding like you know how would how would you say we could evaluate or learn how to appreciate, you know, mechanical sounding um, algorithmic music? Like, you know, how, how can we hear as, as you do? Yeah, I suppose it's the same as weaving that you, there's certain aspects of it which you just understand differently if you actually do it yourself. Um, I think that's true of weaving. I think it's true of also, um, uh, listening to someone play the guitar, if you're a guitarist yourself, or at least tried, then it will sound different. Um, wh when you've done weaving, you, the whole world changes in a way, because there's textiles everywhere, and suddenly you can perceive um, what their structure is, and you sort of start picking them apart and, and realise that there's some aspect of the world that was a lot more complex than you thought before. Um, and I think it's probably the same about listening to algorithmic music, just by trying out one of these, there's many live coding systems with we had some links um, and and uh, some are really accessible um, and, and uh, fun to play with. So it's something you could just try out and, and then see um, if you can find interesting things in it that you then hear in other, other algorithmic music. Um, or another approach is just to uh, go to a live coding event, um, including, uh, we have these events called Algo Raves where you can uh, dance to algorithmic music. Um, more links will go in the description about that. And so you could just come come along and uh, I experience algorithmic music by dancing to it. And that's another approach. Um, it's all. Mm -hmm. Participate, get involved. Like, you know, start yeah. coding music, start coding weaves. Like, um, as far as I know, like, we can also get, um, are those live looms that you've made also available for, for the general public? Um, they are open hardware. Um, I have a collaborator, Stephanie in Brussels, who is uh, building one herself um, and uh, helping us develop instructions for how to do that. So if you have access to somewhere like a makerspace with a laser cutter, you could make the loom and uh, um, uh, I have a list of electronics you need to build it. Um, it, it and. Uh, also some circuit boards that you can make uh, for controlling it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all open hardware. Everything we do in Penelope project is open access and open hardware and open source software. So um, yes. Yeah, great yes, point. And also then um, a little yeah, plug for our event. Yet, there are going to be loads of workshops and because of the situation, these are all going to be online. So do sign up. Um, and um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you in any of, of these events. And um, so yeah, well, thank you, Alex, for this um, thank you, Julie. very engaging thank you. session. And um, and I, I already think you can write in a very accessible manner. And it's but it's a different level altogether. You know, hearing you speak about your work and seeing the demonstrations um, in real time. So I think my biggest takeaway from all of this is that you know. There are really very different degrees of um, automation and control in both weaving and in music. You know? And despite there being computers, there will always be a place for human co-participation 
um, as long as we're careful and not to always include that in um, the software that we develop. So um, whether it's making music with acoustic instruments or with computers, you know, like my, my biggest takeaway from all this is that they're not so fundamentally different after all, as we might first be led to, to believe. And that's speaking from a musicological um, and musician point of view. So um, how about you, Alex? Like, how would you sum up your, your experience and your involvement in the Penelope project? Yeah, I think yeah, I think that I think you've put the the nail on the head. No, that's not a that's not the right saying. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you put your finger on the button or something. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, th I think uh, yeah, I think that's what it's about. It, it's about seeing that technology isn't something that's new. That we've always worked with technology, whether it's ancient looms or or silicon computers, and um, yeah, that we should look for ways of connecting these different technologies and and thinking about new technologies and technologies like computer programming in terms of craft and and creativity 